Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our lecture series on a history of Western thought, why we think the way we do. This week and the next two weeks, we're going to be sort of bringing it together to explain where all of these disparate kind of philosophies and things that we've been talking about, how they fit, as each week, both to start and to end, I'm putting this up in case you miss any of the lectures or you just love them so much you have to go back and see them again. And this will tell you where you can find them online. That was my wife that left. Um, so if you'd like to go to www.liteachapala.org, and there's a menu bar across the top, and it's under what's called eight week lectures. And both this and the other lectures I've done in this series in the past will be available to you. Um, Today we are going to be dealing with the theme of will in philosophy, particularly with the philosophers of Nicola Machiavelli, William James, and Friedrich Nietzsche. Wilhelm Friedrich Nietzsche. There was a period of about 200 years there when every German man that was born was named Wilhelm or Friedrich or Wilhelm Friedrich or Friedrich Wilhelm. And so Wilhelm, William, Wilhelm Friedrich Nietzsche we're going to talk about today. Previously, of course, we talked about uh, the ancient philosophers' reason, experience, and process. And this is sort of the diagram that shows how the relationship. Expect you to memorize this. Um, we, we began by talking about the fact that there are two major themes in Western philosophy. We're not getting into Eastern philosophy here. That won't be too much to take in in this period of time. But idealism, which is the belief that reality is something that is either internal to us or is known by our minds. That reality is a product of our perception internal versus materialism, which believes we know reality from our senses of the physical world. So internal versus external. Idealism, that there are ideals that we relate to internally, or materialism, that it is the material physical world that is the source of all knowledge and truth. And then we sort of outline the, the philosophers that have fallen to one degree or another into those camps. Plato and Aristotle being the two ancient Greek philosophers that best represented those. Then St. Augustine, who was really the kind of the patron saint of the Protestant movement much, much later, of course he was in the, around 400. But um, he was very much an idealist. He said that faith precedes reason. I believe that I might understand. Thomas Aquinas is the great Catholic theologian. He is still officially recognized by the Roman Catholic Church as the authority on Catholic doctrine. Still to this day. He was in the 1200s. He turned it around and said reason precedes faith. I understand so that I might believe. And he said that that reason was reason that is derived from the material world. So he is much more materialist. René Descartes, the great French philosopher, who said, I think, therefore I am, very internal, it's my internal process. John Locke, the founder of empiricism, or the scientific method, he said people don't have anything inside until they experience the physical world. So we very much focused on the material. David Hume, the great skeptic, Immanuel Kant, Friedrich Schleiermacher, we've talked about all these people. George W.F. Hegel, guess what W.F. stands for? Wilhelm. Wilhelm Friedrich. <laughs> German philosopher. Charles Darwin, which most people don't think of as a philosopher, but his, he was a philosopher in the sense that from Darwin's naturalistic observations and the, his writing of the origin of the species and the descent of man, people took immediately, during Darwin's lifetime even, took philosophical uh, principles from his belief and developed what was immediately called social Darwinism, which means taking the ideas of principle of survival of the fittest and uh, those kinds of things, and applying them to social structures. After Darwin, virtually everybody who came along in a philosophical sense was influenced by him. We also have Karl Marx coming along, dialectical materialism, what we know of as, as communism, um, the idea that human beings are primarily units of economic um, production, and that all of history is a story of economic struggle. And then last, we talked about Alfred North Whitehead, um, the, who is British, but he did most of his work in the United States. He's the first of all of these people who really was in any way American. And today we're going to talk about an American-American, William James. But Whitehead developed what's called process philosophy, or process theology. He actually was much more of a scientist originally, and then developed the idea that change and process is the overriding model by which we need to evaluate everything, that everything is in, the, is in flux, everything is in process, and any reality or truth has to be understood in the sense of them 
the, of, of truth being in process. Everything is much more relative. That's why we got process and relativism under Whitehead's name. Nothing is absolute. It's all in process. In fact, I mentioned last two weeks ago when we talked about this that the very popular book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People by Rabbi Kirshner, is a perfect example of Alfred North Whitehead's process theology because the, the point behind that book is um, why bad things happen to good people is God is doing the best he can, but he's not finished yet either. He's still in process. He hasn't yet reached perfection. God is part of the process. He's in flux, and so therefore he can't keep bad things from happening to good people. All right? That's not a, not a very traditional or orthodox religious way to look at it, but that was very popular. And a lot of people still see that, you know, that God's doing the best he can. Now, out of that, we came up with a number of different kinds of isms. These are philosophical approaches that I believe are especially reflected in modern times. And this is going to be something we focus on as we go through the rest of these lectures. First, there was the idea of subjectivism, and I'm, I'm linking that with rationalism. They're not exactly the same thing. Subjectivism is a focus on my perception. Rationalism is the focus on my mind, that the rational is the source of all reality. Subjectivism and rationalism would say it's all about me, it's what I think, what I experience, or what I prefer. And that rationality, my ability to think about something and understand it rationally, is the source of all truth. It's not how I feel about it. It's not what I experience of it. It's what I think about it. When, and and the, the people who represented that, uh, particularly Rene Descartes, Emmanuel Kant, Friedrich Schleiermacher, Schleiermacher, German theologian, his name was Friedrich. Uh, my point. Um, and G.F.W. Hegel, G.F.W., George Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel. Um, Hegel, all of these guys represented this sort of, it's about me, about what I think and how I perceive things. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Kant said, my brain processes the experiences and creates reality by organizing in a certain way, but it's, what, it's me, it's my reality and my brain. Schleiermacher said, it, it doesn't matter whether God exists, it's your experience of the divine. It's about me. You know, um, so these guys really planted the seeds of the me generation and of the rationalism being the highest of all values, the highest source of truth. We then have scientism. Now you'll notice, when I say scientism, well, it's even subjectivism, it doesn't mean I don't believe in being subjective sometimes. To realize what I think about things. Rationalism doesn't mean I don't believe in being rational, but when you add the ism, it means it pushes to an extreme. Scientism, I love science, science is great, but scientism is the belief that science and empirical observation are the only sources of truth, which means there is no such thing as a, a, a supernatural experience. Faith, hope, even love are not real things other than if perhaps you can identify them as chemical reactions in the brain. So it is believed that science and empirical, that is, observation of the material world with our senses is the only source of truth. And John Locke, who invented empiricism and said people are blank tablets until they experience the world. Charles Darwin, who said we're just advanced levels of animals, we're no different than any other animal except we're at the highest end of the, of the pyramid. Uh, Karl Marx, who said that the his Dialectical uh, materialism, the materialism part of that, is that it is looking at the events and making judgments from a scientific and empirical objective kind of view in order to be able to determine policy. That's what, why communism seems so heartless in so many ways, because it was very scientific in its approach. We then have skepticism, the belief that, you know, how do you know anything? How can you be sure? How do you know? Descartes started that with, I think, therefore I am, because he, he doubted everything else. He was skeptical of everything else. He said, what is the most I can be absolutely sure of? Because I doubt everything. I can be sure that if I'm thinking about this, I must actually exist. And then Hume, who said, just because you've experienced something in the past does not mean that same thing is going to happen in the same circumstance in the future. You're just making an assumption. You don't know for sure. He introduced into... Uh, philosophy, particularly epistemology. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy that says, how do you know anything? He introduced this great skepticism that said, you can't know anything. And has made it difficult to do any kind of other you know, productive philosophical work ever since then. Relativism. The idea that truth is not absolute, but it varies with different experiences. 
Hume said that just because it happened one, for you or at one time doesn't mean it's going to happen again. Kant said, your brain may process things somewhat different than mine does. Schleiermacher says, it's your experience of the divine, not that the divine is in any way objective. Um, and Alfred North Whitehead said that you will experience things in process in a different way. And so everything is relative. And then, humanism. The idea that there is, that science, Jesus, there's no need for theism or belief in the supernatural. Truth must be centered on human agency and science rather than revelation from a supernatural source. It's all about people. And there is nothing outside people. There is no God. There is no supernatural. Hegel, Darwin, Marx, Whitehead all really represented that. So you see this progression with these philosophers being the primary people who planted these seeds about making it about me rather than be, believing that you know I might not be the center of the whole universe about believing that the mind is the only real way to find truth, that science, which is the use of the mind applied to the material world, is the only source of truth, that you have to be skeptical, you know, you can't know anything for sure, you can't tell me that something is true because you can't prove it. Relativism, the idea that there is no such thing as absolute truth of any kind. And then humanism, that people, and what people think and what people say, is the point that there is no need for a God, that there is no need for anything supernatural. I think you can see all those things reflected in the way our culture goes today. So today we want to talk about will, and we bring in, it's almost like today we, we get to the dark side of force. Because the three people we're going to talk about today, um, while at least the first two may not have meant to be dark, their thinking ended up becoming dark. The first one, which you might be surprised to know that he was considered perhaps the, the most important greatest political philosopher of the entire Renaissance is Niccolo Machiavelli. You have heard the name Machiavelli, or you've at least perhaps heard someone referred to as being Machiavellian. That's a pejorative. It means someone who is willing to do anything to get, get and keep power, right? Well, Machiavelli, he had a number of different roles in the um, 15th, early 16th century in Florence. Now, this was a time when there were four great city-states in Italy. There was not a united Italy at all. Florence, Milan, Naples, and Venice were the four great city-states, but they were vying or competing against France and Spain, against the Holy Roman Empire, under the Holy Roman Emperor, and against the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. Those were the four great powers in continental Europe. Well, these four city-states, just the cities, were struggling to try to compete economically, uh, politically and, you know, in every other way. For instance, you can imagine the city of Florence trying to defend itself against the armed might of Spain. And yet, they saw this. So this was a time of enormous political intrigue and of struggle for political power because they saw this as, a, as a necessary for survival. And this influenced all of that. Machiavelli's primary, he had a number of different roles in his life, but the thing he's best remembered for, probably most influential in, that he was focused on the fact that the main concern for political leaders, and this is primarily reflected in his book called The Prince, his main concern uh, for political leaders, Machiavelli said, is to get and keep political power. That for a person who is a prince or a ruler, now this is a time when even Florence was going back and forth between being a monarchy ruled by powerful families like the Medici, in the case of the time of, of uh, Machiavelli, or being a republic, and it actually switched a couple of times in, in his lifetime. He believed in the monarchy. He didn't believe that republics were really a profitable way to go, that you needed to have a strong king or prince, somebody in charge. And so he was a monarchist in that regard. And he, he in the book The Prince, lays out, here's how a prince can be successful. And in doing so, he presents what the Catholic Church even said, and this wasn't published until after his death, so he never got blasted for this. Even the Catholic Church at that time said, this is not what we believe, this is amoral. Because he said, moral concerns for a political leader, a prince or a king, a monarch, are unrealistic and unnecessary. That the idea of doing something simply because it's the right thing to do should not come into the mind of somebody who's a monarch. They should do what is necessary to be a strong monarch. Um, and that the end justifies the means. Being in control. Now, 
the interesting part of this, this, this political philosophy of Machiavelli's, which was, you know, 500 years ago, has directly influenced, especially the last century, politics. The term that's used for this is called realpolitik, which is, and that's become the dominant political theme, especially in sort of, you know, American, European kind of uh, scenarios. Realpolitik means that the, the, it's a government policy of retaining power rather than pursuing ideals. Uh, it's, the, the most extreme forms of it are absolute dictatorship. Somebody takes over a country and doesn't turn it loose until they, they're defeated. They pass it on to their kids or whatever. And that getting and keeping power is the real point. Helping the people isn't the point. Doing, doing what's right is not the point. That those are, those are questions, moral questions, or the idea, you know, Machiavelli did not believe in any absolute values of any kind. He said, you do what works, and what works if you're a monarch is to take power and to keep power. He said, if you need to use deception and you need to use uh, violence, then do it. And he gave specific advice on how to do it. He said, don't be, you know, he said, rulers argue about should they be generous. He said, you shouldn't be generous. Because if you're generous and people don't know it, then they're still going to think you're stingy. It's not going to help you. And if you're generous and people see that, they're going to want to take advantage of it. So it's a bad idea. If you're a ruler, don't be generous. Be stingy. And use violence to control people. And he asked the question, is it better to be loved or to be feared? And he comes down very clearly on the side of being feared. He said, because people can, you know, they may love you one minute, and the minute they feel threatened, in fact, he says, they'll love you and follow you as long as the danger is far away, but when the danger is at your door, all of a sudden they won't love you so much anymore. But if they fear you, they're still going to fear you. So he has this completely amoral, not immoral, but amoral, the idea that morality should not come into the idea of political control. And in doing so, he advocated a very distinct kind of philosophy. A philosophy that was, you know, his readers, as I say up here, included Mussolini, Hitler, Lenin, and Stalin. They very much saw Machiavelli as establishing the pattern that they would follow politically. Um, and this has been very much, this sort of pragmatic view is very much what has become common in, as I say, the 20th century especially. Um, he, he addresses questions like, is it better to punish people or be merciful? And he said, don't be merciful. He said, kill a few of them, the rest of them will shut up, you know, basically. So Machiavelli is, and that's why we get this pejorative word, Machiavellian, that somebody will do anything to take power and to keep power. And that is actually what he's talking about. Although some people would say that that's a misinterpretation, Machiavelli is actually more subtle than that. This is the time, uh, he was writing during the time, and they believe that he may have actually modeled some of his ideas on, Cesare Borgia. You know about the Borgia families? You know, became Pope, ran the papacy, ran, you know, uh, Florence at one time. And so this idea of what do you have to do to get power and to keep power, that Machiavelli was writing to the reality that he was dealing with at that time, and it was actually represented by people like Cesare Borgia and the Borgia family. Um, and it was, again, considered completely outside the ethical norms when, after the book was published at his death, the Catholic Church said, this is not moral, this is not what we would insist on, because, of course, technically everybody was so Catholic and so there's, there's a real concern by everybody else, but still, this philosophy has creeped into our perception of how we are to relate to one another, especially political, but also, and even though he came before uh, Charles Darwin, you know, what was Charles Darwin's big theme? Survival of the fittest. That it is a natural process that the strong will defeat the weak. That the strong will control the weak. That, you know, uh, red and tooth and nail, as one of the, the, the poets wrote about that. The idea that you can't, you can't declare a judgment if a lion kills a zebra. Because that is the strong killing the weak to survive. Right? Well, social Darwinism applied the same thing to people. And said that people who are stronger, if they have the power to, to take over and control others, to rule over them, then social Darwinism said that's right. And in fact, it led to things like euthanasia, social Darwinism did, meaning killing people who are weak, you know, uh, putting them out of society's misery, the idea of euthanizing, 
mentally retarded people, people with severe disabilities, etc. This was very, very popular after Darwin up until the 1930s. The end of the 1930s, because this is a, this is a program that Hitler implemented, it became very unpopular after the Second World War. And nobody today would openly claim to be a, a, a eugenicist, I don't think. But this is actually, even though Machiavelli came beforehand, he's reflecting exactly the same values that Charles Darwin did. Survival of the fittest. If you're strong enough to take over, you should. And you shouldn't have, there's no vet, more, you know, Darwin said there's no morals associated when a lion kills a zebra. The people who followed him, the social Darwinist, says there's no moral evaluation that should be applied when a strong person controls the people who are weaker. Well, that's exactly what Machiavelli had said 300 years earlier. And so Darwin, speaking from a natural, naturalist point of view, was reflecting the same political reality that Machiavelli had, pre had presented 300 years earlier. Survival of the fittest. The strong should rule. The strong should control. And if you and, and there is no morals that can be applied to the strong. They should do whatever they have to do in order to gain and keep power. That's Machiavelli. And again, it was more than just a political statement. It became a philosophy that influenced a lot more. Here's a long quote that I will read to you from The Prince. This is Machiavelli's great work. He wrote other things as well, by the way, but The Prince is the one he's known for. He writes this. Here the question arises, is it better to be loved than feared or vice versa? I don't doubt that every prince would like to be both, but since it is hard to accommodate these qualities, if you have to make a choice, to be feared is much safer than to be loved. For it is a good general rule about men that they are ungrateful, fickle, liars and deceivers, fearful of danger and greedy for gain. Other than that, they're okay. <laughs> While you serve their welfare, they are all yours, offering their blood, their belongings, their lives and their children's lives, as we noted above, so long as the danger is remote. But when the danger is close at hand, they turn against you. Then any prince who has relied on their words and made no other preparations will come to grief. Because friendships that are bought at a price and not with greatness and nobility of soul may be paid for, but they are not acquired. And they cannot be used in time of need. People are less concerned with offending a man who makes himself loved than one who makes himself feared. The reason is that love is a link of obligation which men, because they are rotten, will break any time they think doing so serves their advantage, but fear involves dread of punishment from which they can never escape. Returning to the question of being feared or loved, I conclude that since men love at their own inclination, but can be made to fear at the inclination of the prince, a shrewd prince will lay his foundation on what is under his control, not on what is controlled by others. He should simply take pains not to be hated, as I said. And he says that the way to keep from being hated is don't take their property away from them, and it, he says, in fact, people will forget the, the, the death of their father sooner than they will the loss of their inheritance. And so he, he gives instructions on how, how not to be hated, especially, you know, make sure that they're material well, materially well off and they'll like you. Right? So this is Machiavelli. Any questions about that? And he is a, he's a political philosopher, but he is a philosopher. Yes? I'm talking about Darwin. I thought Darwin considered himself a Christian. He did not. He never did. The story that Darwin became a Christian on his deathbed or considered himself a Christian, he never, given his, his time, he never openly said, the natural conclusion of my belief is that there is no God. He pretty much lived that way. I mean, that, that was assumed. Okay. The next person on our list. I push the right button. William James. Here's somebody you may not even know about unless you're an educator. Do we have any teachers? Anybody who's taken classes in, you know, in, in teaching, then you probably have studied something of William James because his principles were applied to education a great deal. James, American, the, only, the first American we're dealing with on this list, as I say, William North Whitehead, taught in America, but he was British. James was a psychologist and a philosopher who developed the philosophy of pragmatism. Now, he started out as a, as a psychologist in his first book, The Principles of Psychology, print, uh, published in 1890, is considered still to this day one of the foundational documents in our understanding of modern psychology. And in it, he established himself as one of the most influential thinkers of the 19th and early 20th centuries. It really did establish him as one of the great minds of that whole uh, period. And he dealt with the principle of functionalism in psychology. Before, before William James, psychology was considered a branch of philosophy dealing with um, 
questions, morals, for instance, and things of that sort. He really changed that so that psychology became a laboratory science, you know, where you would do experiments on rats or where you would do experiments on people. He moved it from the realm of philosophy to being very akin to a hard science. And that was entirely his work because he focused on the functionality. What causes people, it's a cause and effect, like an experimentation, what causes people to have certain psychological predilections or to think in a certain way and how can you change that in ways that are positive? That's not how psychology was done before William James. And much of his psychology then later on got, got, became translated into uh, pedagogy, of teaching, how you more effectively address the psychology of children, particularly, in teaching them. Um, and so that's why he's known to teach her probably more than anybody else. Later on, he took these empirical methods, these sort of cause and effect, the scientific part, the laboratory science part of what he had developed in psychology, and began to then go back and apply it to philosophy and to apply it particularly to religious issues. One of his other very famous books is The Varieties of Religious Experience, which he, he published in 1902. Uh, I have that book on my shelf because he, he actually offers a very sympathetic approach to religious experience of all kinds, but not because he believes in God, because he really didn't. He didn't believe in anything absolute. He didn't think there was any absolute anything, but he said religion can be very helpful psychologically. And so his book, The Variety of Religious Experience, speaks to it as a psychological phenomenon that can be beneficial to people, whether it's real or not. Okay. So he's sympathetic, but not very, he doesn't have a whole lot of belief in it. Um, and that's both religious and mystical kinds of experience. The, as we say up here, his key thoughts were that reality is what we make of it. There is no objective. I just said there's no absolute. Truth is what works. This is why this is called pragmatism. Because what is true is what works. It is the ultimate, you know, that what achieves the desired results. The end justifies the means is exactly what pragmatism is all about. If it works for you, then it must be true for you. There is no such thing as objective truth. There is no such thing as any objective truth or reality or goodness that is apart from somebody's sense that that is good or true or real. It's entirely what works for you. Or what, particularly what works for me, okay? <laughs> Ideas are only meaningful in terms of the consequences. An idea has no value in itself unless it does has some consequence that is beneficial, that is what you want. If it gets you where you want to go, then that's good. If it doesn't get you where you want to go, then it must not be true. So he wipes out any idea of objective truth of any kind. He's going back in that regard to Schleiermacher and others. Schleiermacher who said, it isn't whether there's a God, it's your experience of the divine. This is very much what we would hear from William James. And he says, if there aren't measurable consequences that are positive for you, then there can be no real meaning or truth. Entirely what works. This, as I'll talk about when I get to the list of isms, ended up turning into, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. Because it doesn't work for me. I don't like it. There's no such thing as absolute truth. It also, by extension, becomes things like, well, if it feels good, do it. The sexual revolution can point back to William James as being its founder. Because the idea that, well, this is something I want. This is something that works for me. This is something that satisfies me. And so therefore I'm going to do it. The idea that there is some objective morality that you should pay attention to, that fooling around with whoever will agree to is not necessarily a good idea. William James, in pragmatism, said, hey, if it works for you, it must be true. It must be good. Go for it. If it feels good, do it. You can see that in our culture. Particularly the, his rejection of any idea of inherent value in anything, be it God, the Christian faith, any religion, morality. If it doesn't work for you, it must not be true, at least for you. So truth becomes relative. No absolutes, no single idea of goodness, no justice or truth that is objective. So, and as I said, in his varieties of religious experience, he did acknowledge that, that belief in God seemed to work for some people, 
And so therefore, he considered it partly verifiable. He's beginning to get into the empirical idea that if you can verify it, the verification principle, which I will talk about next week when we talk about the logical positivists. I don't have a name on that because I didn't have one leader and they're all dead. Nobody's a logical positivist anymore, and I'll explain that next week. But this idea that if you can verify it empirically, that it must have some value, he said, well, people's experience of God seems, people get, you know, they get healthier when they believe in God. They, there seems to be some evidence. I don't believe in God, but um, it might be true for some people. And so, situation ethics is introduced as a philosophy. That what's true will change from one moment to the next, depending upon what works out for you. This is huge. Okay. Yes? Wouldn't this be so chaotic? I mean, what works for me is I have that parking place. It doesn't work for you that I take it. You know what I'm saying? It just means right. that everybody's in conflict. Yeah, it's, it's, it's anarchy. Chaotic. It sounds like anarchy. Now, James would say that's why you have uh, political structure. That's why you have society organized as it is. Because that way people can't just kill each other because I like this, you know, and you I don't. I like this and you, you can't have it, right. So he would, he would say that since it's the, you know, what, what works is true, what works is good, well, it doesn't work if everybody starts tearing each other apart because they disagree with other people what's good, what's good and true. And so he would say that's why we have an organized culture. That's why we have an organized society. Who decides what's good? Is to keep us from tearing ourselves apart. And, and it, they would determine, well, what's, what's good for the greatest number of people. Uh -huh. Not that there is some, some, any truth that, or goodness that's absolute on its own, but what's the best for the most number of people is the best truth. And that's the one society is responsible for picking. But individually, we each, have to, we each have to make a decision on what's good for me, because that's what's true for me. And so that's how you can get Jane Fonda saying to the Archbishop of Canterbury, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. That doesn't work for me. If for no other reason than because I don't prefer it. Okay? It comes down to what you prefer. Because I like it better, so it must work better for me. Okay? I think we can see a problem with that. You just identified it. The strong, we're back to that idea that the strong should rule. Okay? So that's the second person. The third person we want to talk about is Friedrich Nietzsche. German. Um, he only lived to be 56 years old, and he spent the last 10 years of his life in an insane asylum. He was philosopher, poet, skeptic, cynic, madman, quite literally. Nietzsche was a genius. He was named to the full professorship of philology, the study of language and words, at the University of Basel when he was 24 years old. To be a full professor at a German university at 24 years old is unheard of. He was a genius. He was one of the foremost poets in his period. In fact, the freedom to be creative was one of the things he really advocated. His key thoughts were the will to power. The idea of the Superman, or as he called it, the Ubermensch, German. What's his first name? <laughs> okay. um, actually, his second name is Wilhelm. Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche. Um, he believed that the goal was for individuals to free themselves from the restrictions and the constrictions of popular morality. He believed that morality, that all of, in fact, he called them slave moralities, especially Christianity. But any system that tried to say there was right and there was wrong and you should do what's right, he said is just the mob. In fact, when, when he talked about the, you know, the common people, he referred to them as the mob or the herd, which gives you some idea of his feeling about them. He thought it was the obligation of all who were able to become ubermensch, supermen, who, who threw off this slave morality that was just trying to control them so that, they, so that they would not take power over the weaker. He, like the two previous people I just talked about, said that the powerful should take power. He is perhaps most famous for saying God is dead. Now, when he said God is dead, Nietzsche did not mean God was a supernatural being who used to be alive and now he has died. You know, let's bury him. What he meant was God has become irrelevant. The belief in God has become irrelevant. That we are at a place in human development that we no longer need this external force trying to tell us 
who we are and how we should act, that we need to rise up and claim it for ourselves, and that we need people to be supermen, to not be controlled by other people's morality, to determine our own morality, and to be independent so that we might then be fully free and creative, and that the goal would be for these Ubermensch to be strong and liberated, create their own morality, take control of society, destroying all things that would be limited, all gods, etc. Now, as I say here, in that way, he became the spirit of the age for the 20th century, with his emphasis on power, the achieving of power, on will, on release from traditional values, survival, and success for the strong. The idea that um, if I have a business, part of my job is to drive everybody else who's in the same business out of business, because I'm superior to them, and I have the will, and I have, you know, I'm not willing, and, and if that means that I have to cheat and steal and lie on my taxes and do whatever, Nietzsche would say those more, just like Machiavelli did, those moral values don't apply to you. Now Machiavelli did it in the political realm, Nietzsche said it in every way. We need people to do that. To take power, the will to power, to be one of those who is strong enough to throw off all of the conventional moralities and to rise up. Now, as I say, he, when he was 44 years old, he was committed to a mental institution. He had periods of time when he, he had to step out of public life for, for periods because of difficulties with depression and other mental illness. And then finally one day, he, 10 years before his death, he watched a uh, Carthage man beating his horse in the street. And it drove him insane. And he spent the rest of his life pretty much incoherent, apparently, in a mental institution. Um, and, and yet his influence, he not only has influenced modern philosophy, of what values we have. I mean, think about the way we do business these days. The, uh, the very idea of competition, that businesses succeed by being more competitive, by beating out their opponents. That's business according to Friedrich Nietzsche and Machiavelli, and to some extent William James. That you beat down those who are weaker than you and prove that you are the Ubermensch, that you're the top dog. No losers. Nothing about losers. Yes? To me, it sounds like Ayn Rand. Well, to some extent, Ayn Rand uh, applied the same kinds of principles to economics as well. I mean, she, um, and other things. Um, Ayn Rand is one of my least favorite people in the whole world. <laughs> Camille Pagliat, you know, but anyway. But this um, guy sounds like a sociopath. Well, like anything goes, it's just whatever I want. I mean, he sounds, he sounds nuts. I mean, he was nuts. I mean, so... He sounds like a sociopath. I mean, I like to think businesses try to offer more value to people, and that's why they get the business. Right. Not because they're cheating and lying and stealing and whatever. But, I mean, there are those that do. Exactly. Right? But that's Nietzsche. Yeah. That, I'm going to give you some examples here in a minute, but I'll give you one right now in response to that. Do you, you remember the movie Wall Street? You remember Michael Douglas's character, Gordon Gecko? Do you remember the famous speech he gave to the employees and or the stockholders in order to convince them to go with him on this deal? Greed is good. Greed works. That's the American business principle. Yes, there are businesses that are moral and that try to work in terms of providing better service and winning in that way. But it is all too common, especially the higher up the go, you know, the larger the companies. Uh, corporate, corporate espionage is common. I mean, there are companies that that their entire focus is preventing corporate espionage in the large companies. And there's others who's, who sort of under the table, their business is doing corporate espionage. So the idea of being able to take advantage of a weakness in your opponent in order to gain an advantage, become the Ubermensch. Politics, business, economics, whatever. Okay. No losers. You, can, you know, loser is the worst thing you can call somebody, right? Have we heard that recently? Yes. Was he responsible for Nazism in any way? Not directly, but indirectly. The, again, all, all three of these guys, probably Nietzsche of all of them, was the one that, that Hitler and others looked at him, and the German especially, and saying, like that idea, if we're able to take over, then we are. And in 
fact, the Nazis called themselves the super race, right? Just like Superman, Uber Mensch. So very consistent. In fact, interestingly enough, Nietzsche was, as a poet, he was also a very close friend of Richard Wagner, you know, the, the musician, the, the composer, and, and Wagner was a favorite of the Nazis. Okay, this is the, because of the Ring of the Nibelung and everything else, the mythology of power and of taking control and all of that, all of this is of kind. And so Nietzsche was very influential in that time period and in that, in that way. Um, now, interestingly, later on in the 1960s and 70s, a number of American theologians picked up, now Nietzsche has been very influential in a lot of ways, they picked up this idea, particularly two theologians, Thomas Al Altizer and Paul Van Buren, picked up the idea of God is dead. Remember the Time Magazine? Is God dead? On the cover? Interestingly, the bishops of the Methodist Church, after that article, got together and voted on whether God was not dead, and they voted two to one that he was still alive. Oh. <laughs> For which I'm sure God was grateful. <laughs> um, I hate to be one of those one of the ones who voted against. Um, Anyway, the idea of God is dead, and the reason that Altizer and Van Buren did this is because they were trying to make Christianity, they thought, more relevant to believers in the 60s and 70s. Why? Because take away all of the controls of this slave morality that comes from believing that there is a God, and you are free, and it's more appropriate to the culture. Maybe it's more appropriate to the culture in the 60s, but I think we're beginning to learn better than that. So this was the influence of Nietzsche. I will give you a quote from Thus Spake Zarathustra, which is one of his most famous works. And, there, and Zarathustra spoke thus to the people, I teach you the Superman, Ubermensch. Man is something that should be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? You should be more than just a man, in other words. All creatures hitherto have created something beyond themselves, and do you want to be the ebb of this great tide? and return to the animals rather than overcome man? What is the ape to man? A laughing stock or a painful embarrassment? And just so shall man be to the superman, a laughing stock or a painful embarrassment. You have made your way from worm to man, and much in you is still worm. Once you were apes, and even now man is more of an ape than any ape. But he who is the wisest among you, he also is only a discord and hybrid of plant of ghosts. But do I bid you become ghosts or plants? Behold, I teach you the Superman. The Superman is the meaning of the earth. Let your will say, there's the will, let your will say the Superman shall be the meaning of the earth. Once blasphemy against God was the greatest blasphemy, but God died, and therefore these blasphemers died too. How can you believe in God if you're influenced by that? And yet, this has become a dominant philosophy. Particularly, and some of the people we're going to talk about next week, like Jacques Derrida and the Deconstruction Movement. Um, this chart gives you sort of an outline of influences. And you'll notice here, I've got Charles Darwin. I know this is hard to see, but I've got too many names to make it bigger. Charles Darwin greatly influenced uh, the kind of thing. You now, Machiavelli was before Darwin, but again, the idea of survival of the fittest, that if you're stronger, you should be the one that takes over. The lion kills the zebra, not the other way around. Machiavelli had reflected that 300 years before, and yet that's, that applied to a naturalistic kind of uh, observation, is what Darwin, so those two things are linked. William James, pragmatism and subje subje subjectivism, if it works for me, it must be true. That's pragmatism. If it doesn't work for me, then it must not be true for me. So truth is relative. And then, and then Nietzsche, will to power, radical pragmatism. Take control. Be a superman. Rule the earth. Everyone else is just a worm. <laughs> or a lower form of primate. Okay? Again, it, it does sound crazy. And he was crazy. But this, the reason he was a major philosopher in the 19th century is that kind of influence, while not as the hard edge of it, didn't carry, but the principles that it's up to me to be great, and it's up to me to be greater than other people. This idea, you can be anything you want. You can rule the world if you really have the will to do it, right? Carolyn's mom used to say, you can, you can have anything you want. You just can't have everything you want. <laughs> Nietzsche would say, you can have everything if you just have the will to power. It's on you. 
has become a dominant theme in modern society, Western society. Okay? It seems like it gives some sort of moral um, validation to sociopaths. I mean, the people to just lie, cheat, do whatever you want. There's no, like, right or wrong. I mean, it just sounds crazy to me. That yep. people, that, so, no, really, I, I, don't, I don't understand how this would be such a valid thing that people would study and... The appeal of being able to be in power is it, justified. Yeah. On social you don't, you don't, oh, somebody else right. thinks that I can be, to be yeah. completely <laughs> free of any limitations, anybody yeah. else's judgment, anybody else's Sounds moral evaluation, and to, to be in control is a huge desire. And in yeah. fact, yeah. how many self help books are there? Are they not <laughs> all, in one way or another, an effort to try? To have a will to power, to be better than I am, and better probably than other people. Slimmer thighs in 30 days. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to be skinnier than that girl on TV because I think I'm better than her, or whatever. The, the, this idea that the, the um, if I have the will, I can control, and if I can control, then I'm more, I'm better. This, all of this, you can be anything. That's Nietzsche. The hard edge, the sort of psych, you know, and I agree, this sort of pathological uh, weirdness, the edge was taken off of it, but it is reflected in modern society. Okay? We've looked at these already um, in terms of subjectivism and relativism, scientism, skepticism, rel uh, the uh, rationalism, relativism, humanism. I would add, in addition to Hegel, uh, Darwin, Marx, Whitehead, Humanism, the idea that there is no God or supernatural truth is found in humans and science rather than revelation from supernatural source. I would add James and Nietzsche to that because William James denied any absolute. It's all about people and what works for that for, them, for you. And then Nietzsche denied any external absolute or authority and said it is, it is you have to take control and cast off any other control from outside. I want to introduce two more isms to you from today. The first is pragmatism. Truth is what works. Basically, the end justifies the means. If it feels good, do it. There is no absolute truth. There is no absolute anything. Machiavelli said that around 1500. Um, William James said that. And then Nietzsche, while he would not, he's not technically a pragmatist, because of the fact he said you can take power and you can be the source of what is true and real and you know, etc. I put him in parentheses as being part of the pragmatic kind of thinking as well. And then the one that Nietzsche is primarily responsible for is nihilism. Nihilism literally means meaninglessness. God is dead, nothing has meaning, strength rules. Why do we have an extraordinary increase in the number of suicides in Western society in the late 20th century. Because nihilism has become a fundamental plank in our cultural consciousness. There is no hope. There is no meaning. There is no God. There is no absolute. The best thing I can do is get out of this. You know about the, the 28 Club, the number of celebrities, of people of note, particularly entertainers, musicians, Janis Joplin, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, and on and on. It's called the 28 Club because all of them were 28 years old and they took their own lives, either intentionally or through an abuse of drugs. The number of people who achieved everything they thought was of value. They became celebrities. Their albums were selling in the millions. People practically worshipped them. They are rich beyond anything they could possibly ever spend. And they blow their brains out or fry them with drugs when they're 28 years old because there's no meaning, there's no hope. This is nihilism. It has become one of the most fundamental planks in Western consciousness, particularly as of the last half of the 20th century. And Nietzsche is the one that really represents that. Nietzsche is the prophet of the movement of nihilism. And how did he end up? Okay. But to some extent, Machiavelli and James, also the idea that God is dead, nothing has meaning, strength rules. Machiavelli said there's no morality, there's nothing outside you, you've got to take control. It's strength that matters. And because he said there's no morals, it, you know, there's no such thing as not 
You know, as being immoral if you're a leader, morals don't apply to you. Therefore, there is no source outside you that, that says that there's an objective morality. And James, who said, if it works for you, great. Well, the problem is when people find out that it doesn't work for them, Club 28. So pragmatism directly led to this nihilism as well. I told you this was the dark side of the force. <laughs> but these things are more so perhaps than some of the other people we looked at. These, these were progressions. And that's why I've been showing you, you know, that chart of the, the relationship of the different philosophers is because this has become a progression of thinking. It is built upon the things before. But in terms of directly, we probably have left less influence culturally in terms of our psyche from the great philosophers like Kant or Hegel or whatever than we do the more recent ones. Like these guys, more recent in terms of the, uh, James and Nietzsche. And then next week, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, the logical positivists who are science-oriented, science you know, the verification principle means you have to be able to prove it scientifically or it's not real or true. And then Jacques Derrida, deconstruction. Deconstruction says not only, you know, can you not find truth, but there is no such thing as truth. It doesn't exist. Meaning doesn't exist. There is no meaning. There is no truth. Stop looking. You're wasting your time. Is that not nihilistic? Is that not built upon the same platform that these guys, especially Nietzsche, planted? Yes, Carla. So there are our saints. Where are our church fathers in this? Okay. Well, the last week I'm going to talk about, so where do we go from here? I'm presenting these people as not being the goal. <laughs> presenting them as being, uh, we're talking about them because I think they are the ones that in our popular culture today, I talk about the psyche or the consciousness of modern Western society. These are the guys that, that built that structure more, unfortunately, than a lot of the moral examples. Now, the moral examples still have influence, but... You know, I'm talking about what is the dominant psyche of Western culture, and these guys were the influencers. The last week, I'll give you a little preview. My point's going to be you don't have to go there, even though this is this is the majority, this is the dominant. And in fact, once we recognize these things, and that's why I'm doing this whole lecture series, once we recognize these things, then we can make an evaluation about them until we can see them, until they become visible to us, which they're not in most cases. And the fact that they were invented by somebody. That we can identify who and when these ideas came up. We know where things like scientism and skepticism and relativism, philosophically speaking, where those developed. Once we know that, then we can make our own value judgments about whether we're going to go along with popular ideas about those things or whether we're going to look for an alternate path. Okay? Yes, Pam? This all is so naive. This week it is. I'm hoping you're going to bring in people that did something about it. Well, and again, the last week, the last week, where do we go from here? Yeah, that's that's what I want to deal with. But um, the fact is that it is negative. Uh, when, I, when I first did this series, and I did it in a church context, and so I had a little more Christian stuff involved in it, the title of it was, What is Wrong with the World? Because we do have a messed up culture. You know, Western society, you know, spend half an hour watching the news sometimes, have we not gotten ourselves into a dark place? And I think this is a reason we have. Because we don't even know. Probably the majority of you don't, would not recognize half of the names on the list I put up there. And yet they are the ones who taught you how to think. That's why we're doing this lecture series. So that you'll know where these ideas came from and what those ideas are and how they influence us. And then you can make your own call. If you want to become a Nietzschean nihilist, then that's entirely up to you. But at least know what you're doing. Shoot you. Okay. Any questions about that? What's that? Well, yeah. Again, this is this is open to people of all beliefs. But the, she said it seems satanic. Talk about that. Uh, yes. Pragmatist and pragmatism is not the same thing. 
to be a pragmatist is a good thing. It means, it means you weigh the cost. It means that you're realistic about what you can do and what it's going to cost you to do it. That's, you know, you're a pragmatist when you go to the store and decide, well, I have enough money to pay for the groceries in my car. That's a pragmatist. That's a good thing. Pragmatism as a philosophy is very different. It's saying, um, it's taking the idea of, um, it's taking the idea to an extreme and saying something is only good, it's only true, it's only real if it works for you. There's no objective reality. So again, when you put an ism on the end of these words, I don't have a problem with, I love science. Scientism is a problem. I, you know, I love the, the idea, of, in fact, the word humanism actually has a positive bent, where you're concerned about the welfare, you know, and the development of human beings. There is a positive aspect of it. But as a philosophy, humanism means people are all they are, and it's actually linked to the idea that we're just animals, so we're just trying to satisfy animal needs without there being any other higher values. Um, I believe in being pragmatic. You're an idiot if you don't try to be pragmatic. But pragmatism as a philosophy is problematic. And it's sometimes smart to be skeptical. If you yeah. read Facebook, exactly. be skeptical. Yeah. <laughs> Every, you know, Facebook, not everything, be skeptical. Not everything on the internet is true. <laughs> right. And so I think all of that, you know, rationalism. I absolutely believe in being rational. I believe in rationality. God gave us a mind to use. And one of our biggest problems is we don't use it anymore, most people. And yet rationalism means that's all you've got. And I don't believe that's true. What happens then? If, if all we have is our rationality, if rationalism is true, then what happens to love and honor and loyalty and trust? All of those things that are not products of rationality. Yes, Terry. Well, I just, these things, the philosophical implications of our thinking, uh, to me, are kind of like a wake up call. They, they, these are around us all the time in our, in our culture. Uh, and if we, and very subtly, if we don't, if we're not conscious that we're right. being bombarded by these the values that go along with this thinking, then we're, we're at peril. Right. So we need to like, wake up and think, okay, where, you know, check the source. Where is it coming from? What's behind it? What's our reason? Uh, or thought, or faith, or belief that's behind the messages that we're, we're being hit with every day. Exactly. The, the, uh, the need, what do you call it, the selfie generation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't actually read the article, but I saw the headline on MSN. It said, exactly how many selfies did, did Kim Kardashian take on her last vacation? You know? <laughs> I'm sure it must be an astronomical number that would have a headline like that. So, yeah, it's very much true. And we, once you realize these things, they affect you every day. Pragmatism, the idea, you know, again, Gordon Gekko, greed is good, greed works. So if it works, does that always mean it's good? I'll give you a very practical example that Guillermo and I and Dean Hansen, the treasurer of our church, are dealing with. We've got a government official who's saying you either have to pay a fee of 140,000 pesos or you can give me, you can pay 40,000 pesos and give me an extra 10. In cash. In cash. <laughs> and that'll be all. Well, that'd be easy. You know, we'd save two thirds of the money, more than half. Um, would we do that? Isn't that pragmatically sensible? No, it's not sensible. We're breaking the law. We're encouraging graft. We are not going to do that. And as I said in conversations with the Hansons and also with, with Guillermo this morning, if we say we're going to break the law and pay more data in order to get a, you know, two-thirds less of a bill, then where do we say we reach the point in breaking the law that we're not going to go? If we had to kill somebody in order to save that money, would we do that? If that would be what's necessary to make it work, would we do that? Some people say, yes, that's why you have people killing people. It's pragmatic. It's pragmatic. It gets me what I want. It works for me. Where do you draw the line? So this kind of thing, once you're aware of it, you apply it every day. And I, you know, we've agreed, if we have to end up paying 140,000 pesos instead of 50,000 pesos, then we will do that because we will not pay a bribe to someone. I'll bet that's not even the bill. Is that? I'll bet that's not even a real number. You made it yeah, I think that's <laughs> Anyway, the, the idea that once you're aware of these things, they do affect how you think and how you make decisions. And the fact is, the vast majority of people would say, hey, it works to go ahead and pay the 50,000, 10 of it in cash, so that, you know, and just get on with it and not pay as much money. That's practical. That's pragmatic. Actually, that is a reflection of pragmatism. And we won't go there. Not only 
through that, they can justify it by saying, think of all the good we can do with the money that we oh, save. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go down that path. Self-justification is one of the most powerful motivators. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? There is a line at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much.